This is the DMT One to One Show, episode thirty-one, on the sixteenth of October, twenty thirteen. An interview with Remy Harris, author of Music Tanks Easy Money: The Definitive UK Guide to Funding Music Projects. This week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridans at Sheridans.co.uk. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Remy Harris, uh, author of the Music Tank uh, Funding Guide. So, hi, uh, Remy, and great to have you on the show. How's it going? Hi. Hi Andrea, how are you? <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, and uh, Remy heads the consultancy Start Projects uh, and also has extensive experience in events management, having worked uh, on the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony, uh, the Urban Classic Project at the BBC Proms, and the You Are in Control Creative Conference in Iceland. So lots of experience there, and you've also worked on a lot of funding projects. So it's great to have you here and uh, talk about this book. So first okay. of all, uh, you know, we're here to chat about the Easy Money Finance Guide you wrote, and this is a very dense uh, a document. So let's start with the broad, uh, broad strokes. Uh, what is this book all about? It's uh, basically a book about how the music industry has changed um, from being an industry where we had an internal funding model where we could go to other people in the same industry and get finance for developing new artists. Yeah. So I think everybody's really aware of that, um, and especially people that work in, in digital music and, and have seen all the changes going on in digital are aware of the disruption that has been in the music industry. And one yeah. of the effects of that has been that people need to look outside of the music industry now in order to find finance to develop artists. Yeah. Um, so just to give you an idea, when I first started working at AIM about 15 years ago now, um, at that time, it was possible for people to go to distribution companies and get um, an advance still sure. for um, you know advance uh, sales of their uh, CDs, yeah. um, and use that money to market and to record and to support their artists is not possible now. So it's really about how that change has happened, and then it goes straight into practical tips about the six key ways of getting music finance. So the key, six key sources: um, crowdfunding grants money from friends and family is a really important one for anyone that's bootstrapping a business as you know yeah. um, it looks at investment it looks at debt finance and it also looks at uh, corporate sponsorship or commercial sponsorship as well yeah. so it's a real practical guide but it's based in this in this need that and so uh, how did the project come about so it must have taken a long time to write the book and of course you drew from your experience and i'm sure it was a long process of research as well so how did that come about Sure. Well, I mean, um, I mentioned that I used to work at AIM, Association right. of Independent Music. I worked there for 10 years. And, and during that time, just by chance, really, that I was the person dealing with some of the finances, um, I became known as the funding person. Yeah. And I also <laughs> did some, some, some fundraising, as, I, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, and, and raised money from public funding to fund some of AIM's projects. So I became like this expert, but I didn't really know a lot. Um, and I just became more and more fascinated by the subject and more and more determined to answer the question, how do I raise money yeah. to fund my band or fund my artist putting an album out? Um, and it's just a question for so, so many people in the music industry. Yeah. And then as time went on, I just started to campaign. Uh, so when I worked at UK Music um, as director of operations, we had a big campaign, which was to do with the access to finance in, in the terms of bank loans, a yeah. uh, big kind of publicity campaign and, and uh, a big piece of lobbying that went to the government. Uh, and, you know, these things take a very long time to be realised. I realise people need the information now um, to be able to actually apply that to, to, to work that they're doing now. So, yeah. you know, the idea came about. I, I talked to Music Tank about it and they were really enthusiastic about the idea and, and really supported it and have ended up publishing the book so it's great that's awesome that's great and uh, looking at how uh, you talked about the evolution of uh, how musicians uh, have to go about uh, funding a release and uh, i think that um, i was gonna ask you first thing uh, how do you think the funding situation has changed over the last 10 years is it has it become easier for musicians to try and fund their recording directly it's become easier because it's become cheaper yeah. to make and distribute the music digitally and there's some, so many great tools and resources out there to do that now. But at the same time, that has disrupted the, the revenue streams that were previously there for recorded music. So, you know, it, that support from the mainstream industry has become a little bit more difficult to come by. I, I do say in the book that obviously, for example, major rec record labels, publishers, and, and in fact, um, live music industry are still really, really important funders, um, biggest funders of, uh, of new music. However, there's fewer 
big record companies to go to yeah. and so there's fewer doors to knock on uh, if you're a developing artist yeah. and so that that leads to the question well where else can you go to to get money that's that's really i feel that's really the change that's happened is there's not as many a and r people with that development budget, budget. as, yeah, as they used to be and and you know you hear managers or i have many friends that are managers you know talk about that all the time it's extremely competitive out there yeah um and there's some great you know, there's some great artists which who, who don't have access to funding from that system. Yeah. So there's just this need there for them to have some alternative ways of, of uh, funding what they do. Absolutely. And, and it, it's also a case of a, a lot of musicians still don't uh, think about uh, the role of a label as the role of essentially like a, a bank with a better marketing system. <laughs> but essentially, you know, it's, it, you know, the fact that labels uh, have less money to spend on this type of development is essentially a causes the fact that musicians have to go and look at alternative ways and look at those alternative ways when you're looking at grants and uh, uh, potential of public money coming into play uh, things like the prs foundation have those increased in uh, a reach and uh, and helpfulness uh, towards musicians and has the internet for example made it easier for musicians to access those resources whereby maybe 10 years ago there were more the realm of, uh, of of fewer musicians that could actually get around finding all that information offline I think it's. I think it's just become essential for musicians to um, take responsibility, really, uh, and ownership for that side of things. Uh, there isn't really anybody there <laughs> wanting to, you know, willing to take that on for a lot of us now. So Absolutely. we have, we, we, you know, we have to, um, we have to take that on ourselves and, and take ownership of that. Um, what I think's happened is that a lot of uh, organisations have been in the in the space between if we're talking about prs foundation and funding and so on yep. have been in that space between the funding sector if you want to call it that and the and the commercial artists so right. i mean historically people will know that um prs foundation was uh grew out of funding for classical music and the same with the arts council uh, and, and, and other bodies yep. and over time there's been interest from those organizations and pressure from outside the organizations for them to change and become more open to all, all genres of popular music and, and right. not just the traditional music so um you know a lot of people have done work including prs foundation and, and their staff and people that have been advising them um to to open up and uh, uh and do things in a way that is accessible really yeah. um so for example i talk in the book about their um funding application process where in the first step you submit music to them and you submit a, a kind of short description and then if you're eligible and they and they like what you do and it's up to a reasonable standard then you go on to doing full applications i think that's really fantastic yeah. um i think that's a, a really good a good way of working when you're trying to give out that particular type of funding to to musicians i think it's a very friendly way of doing it um because these funding applications as i talk about them it can be very daunting their language yeah that you need to use to to uh, communicate is sometimes tricky to master and quite dry and, as well for you know, an artist quite, quite dry for an artist and you know it, it, it has to be really questions have to be answered in a certain way that the funder requires yeah. you know, each invest each investor or each funder has their own separate um, way of way and what they need out of the relationship so it may be that they're a, a charitable trust who has particular needs you know they want to find a particular kind of music or in a particular area yeah. and so it's about aligning yourself with them and in a way with the record companies let's say in the old model or the the, the model that we're used to yeah um you always had to do that as well so in some ways the needs are more aligned yeah. between the artist and the record company they're more in the same world but every every manager knows that Sometimes, you know, the artist's interest and the record company's interest are not exactly the same. Yeah. And part of the job of the manager is to is to represent the artist within that setting. And so it's the same thing with all the other types of, of financial support as well. It's just about kind of aligning yourself to what they do. To what they do. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think the book is, is great just because it gives you a, a really wide perspective on all the options that are out there and i think one of the key things that artists have to do when they get to the stage where they're looking for funding is they have to decide what kind of funding they're going to get and i think that also informs the path that they're going to take over the next six months to a year so that decision is fundamental to their development as well you know whether they go the crowdfunded route or 
uh, you know, the sponsorship or find uh, grants for friends and family, mm. that completely changes the way in which you're going to operate within the next, you know, three to six months. So yeah. that decision is key to their to their development, right? Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's so challenging for artists and I really sympathise with them, especially at the early stages of, of their career as well. Yeah. Um, and it, so it, the, the book kind of talks about what is needed in terms of relate, building relationships in whatever type of funding you decide to go down. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really key. So the people I talk to and, and the case studies in the book where people have had successful crowdfunding campaigns, for example, they were very, very honest about the amount of time an effort it took for them to run their campaign properly and be successful and get the get the uh, thousands of pounds that they um, were looking for yeah. and I think the same goes with whatever you do you know if, if it's sponsorship it's, it's very it's very hard to get you need to work on it and build relationships and also know that that's the way that you want to go you know yeah. the road that you want to go down and I, I think it's I feel encouraged though by writing the book I feel, I feel like it's doable yeah. it's achievable it's it's just like a question of it's a question of focus absolutely um, absolutely and uh you know the, the funding stages are a very interesting concept as well like uh, you talk about how there are you know five funding stages that essentially are uh, similar for whatever type of funding you're looking for you know developing the idea assessing the idea uh, acquiring delivering and reporting on, on that on that particular project so i think that's also a case of the bands looking at any single project that they take on of this kind as a business plan essentially and then develop it accordingly uh almost as if they were, you know, because they are a small business, so they have to behave as such. It's just that the mentality wasn't quite there before and has to be developed. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I think I, I've, got some, I've got some different thoughts about that, actually. I think it's sure. really hard to, um, I think it's really hard to be an artist and also commercialise what you do as well and have that mindset. I do think that, yeah. I do think that if you've got, um, managers or even just another friend right. or another person yeah. there <clears throat> they can be really useful kind of in giving a reality check and an objective view of, of what you're doing yeah. um, and I think I just I do think it's I do think it's very difficult I think it's the, I think it's the new model that's kind of being pushed and I'm always so suspicious of things that are being pushed yeah so I think the um, you know like the I talk about Jay Z a little bit in the in the book, um, and I talk about how uh, you know this mythology or and story has grown up around how he created his his fortune and you know yeah. his empire, selling um, from the back of his car or you know whatever, just doing it all himself. Um, and I kind of uh, I, I kind of am sometimes like a little bit suspicious of that. Yeah. In that I don't think it will work for everybody. Yeah. You know, and some artists are are not going to be able to run as their own business. It's a hard thing to do. Other people are going to feel much more comfortable taking the control into their own hands and running their own business than being with a, a big label, you know. So it's um it's not right for everybody. But yeah. I think the idea of the book is to give the tools and the information so that if that's what you want to do then Absolutely. you can go ahead and, and do that. And do that. And uh, you make you made a great point because you know uh, today, sometimes it feels as if what we're saying in the industry is that if you're an artist that is not good or doesn't feel comfortable or is not interested in running the business side of things, then you're not going to make it. So, you know, sometimes that feels like that's the message just coming out there. But, you know, there are ways in which you can find help. Uh, uh, and if you don't have an official manager, then there, there are ways to find friends or family that can help you with that side of things. And if music, that's what you want to do, you know, there's no reason why if you're not business minded, you shouldn't be able to do that uh, even today, right? Exactly. I mean, um, we're doing it. I think, I think um, you may know, but we're doing a, a convention with Music Tank. Um, right, on the 22nd of October. On the, yeah. on the 22nd of October. And I'll be doing more talks as well. Uh, after that, I'll be at uh, University of Warwick and um, hopefully in Birmingham in, in New Year as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing things like that as a way of helping the people who feel like it might be right for them to talk yeah. about business planning, to talk about how you Absolutely. write applications, um, to talk about investment and how that works. I was really interested to find a couple of companies who had got an investment, which I wasn't really expecting. I yeah. wasn't expecting to find to find that um, from, you know, from uh, relatively small amounts of money. So the, the convention is going to talk about all that and how and how you do it and... Um, and who it's who it's right for 
and hopefully people will find that really useful yeah and uh, uh you know it's, it's it's kind of funny how sometimes uh some things come back around like i uh i read a piece on uh, eurythmic actually uh we're talking about how they got uh, their Sweet Dreams album made uh, thanks to a five grand bank loan that they used to uh, buy equipment to get the recording done. And so, you know, there's examples of this that go all the way back to the 80s. So it's uh, it's cool to see this kind of coming into the mainstream. And, and of course, it's going to be difficult even today for a band to go to a bank and ask for this kind of money. But to know that there are institutions and opportunities for them to have a vision and try and get that vision accomplished uh, uh, even if they don't have the fund themselves that that's that's a fantastic opportunity for them i think yeah definitely i mean i'm i'm, I'm really uh, an avid reader of the, the historical stuff and the rock biographies and things and um i re refer to some of the cases in the book uh refer yeah. to uh, a great book about the history of the independent labels which is um published by cherry cherry red it may be called history of independent labels actually i have to check oh, great i have to check that out um it's a really it's a really great book and it talks about labels like rough trade and uh beggar's banquet and uh, you know how they started out and it talks about how they were financed and it talks about loans from parents and it talks about um you know advances from and deal licensing deals with major labels and amounts and you know how those how those organizations in the 70s working independently grew up you know and and how they how they made it work um and it is interesting actually that both of them started out as as not just as labels but as a record shop in one case and as a mobile dj business and and, and then record shop in the other case you know they were very close to the close to the customer if you like and they were kind of very cool you know, working uh, working with the record bu uh, record buying public and understanding what they want and everything. But I mean, they're just fascinating histories, actually, to see how they were developed. And it, it kind of gives me hope that actually people can come up with new ways of new ways of doing things now. Um, I, I think I think most of those people will say that it's probably it's probably tougher now yeah. um, <laughs> for people starting up now. But um, you know, there's still a lot of fantastic music and, and really great entrepreneurs in this area as well so um it gives me it gives me kind of hope that um people will continue to kind of come up with new things and innovate yeah absolutely and uh, you know it's uh, it's a fantastic read i would uh, recommend uh, uh, people to go and check out a uh, music tank dot co dot uk where you're going to find links uh, to the uh, ebook uh, you're going to find links to the uh, easy money convention which is happening on october the 22nd so if you are in london i would recommend you go on musictank.co.uk and check it out if it's something that you'd like to attend i'm sure you get lots of great information out of it and remy it was a real pleasure having you on the show and uh, uh, it was a pleasure reading your, your ebook as well thank you very much and uh, one other thing i should say anyone sure. that goes into musictank.co.uk can download the first chapter for free perfect as well so they can try before they buy that's fantastic uh, thank you so much for your time thanks for listening to this week's dmt one to one and now a short information piece recorded with this week's sponsors media law firm sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk uh, it's uh, great to be here with uh, tahir bashir with another segment on digital service providers so hi tahir and great to have you on thank you for having me on the show so we're going to talk about uh, terms uh, today in terms between digital service providers and uh, rights holders so first of all uh, let's tackle one of the more uh, uh, common uh, issues that uh, service providers uh, encounter when doing a deal with especially a bigger uh, potential partner but, but also smaller ones uh, which is MFN which is a most favored nation so uh, how do you tackle that and, and what's the best way to really deal with that uh, inevitable uh, roadblock that, that comes up pretty much every time you try and do a deal? Yeah so just to explain to the, the viewers and listeners most fa MFN clauses are most favored nations clauses which effectively means that whatever you agree in this particular deal with your content provider if you agree some Something better with another content provider that then comes into this deal. Um, you know, for me, it's they're horrible clauses. I've seen businesses actually go under as a result of MFN clauses because um, when it comes to the audit stage, um, the uh, service, the content owner audits, sees that somebody else got better terms, and then insists on those, and the company doesn't have it because they've already paid the monies out. Yeah. So uh, for me, it's lazy negotiation. You know, a, a rights owner should know the value of their rights at this stage, um, but inevitably, you know, there are times when you can't get around them and they insist on them. So what you need to do in those scenarios is just make sure that you've got uh, a good lawyer who is carving the actual wording um, so as not to make it too 
too wide and for it to be very specific as to what it actually attaches to. Yeah, absolutely. What are the riskier factors in terms of, do you think like rates, for example, are a precedent that can be risky for, for the startups or are there other particular nitty gritty bits that, that can be uncomfortable for them? Uh, I mean, there's lots of things that can be uncomfortable. R rates are obviously, you know, the commercial, you know, this is what we're paying out. But uh, reality as well. Yeah, territories are, uh, are important. Uh, um, the way that you use the rights, bundling deals, which is, you know, all, you know, uh, you know many see as Shangri-La at this moment in time. Um, you know, being able to work, white, label ser white labeling services, all these types of terms uh, uh, tend to be... Um, you know, tricky, but you know, particularly when you've got a service which is trying something different. Yeah. Then ultimately, what you want to try and uh, encourage the rights owner is, well, let's try this out on a trial period at least. We're not setting a precedent. Let us have a go. We will track what we do, and I think tracking is really important from a DSP's um, perspective because if you can track your usage, track your revenue, track your return, track the kind of number of eyeballs you're getting on your service, this is really good data which then can justify your position moving forward when you're negotiating uh, for the next element. That's great. Thank you very much and until the next segment.